I'm Marty McCafferty. I'm one of the medics here at Dan. And I want to thank you all for joining us today to look at this topic that we talk about quite often. When Dan is asked to do presentations for dive clubs or other organizations, we'll usually ask, is there a particular topic? And we quite often, the reply is, well, anything about dive safety. And that brings up a lot of things. I'm sure everybody has an idea of what is and isn't important to dive safety. And it really comes down to what choices we make as individuals that really give us a perspective on dive safety. One of the things that we never like to talk about, but it's important, is these unfortunately are fatalities that happen when we're diving. Uh, and there's a bit of a prejudice to it. When somebody dies on a golf course, they don't call it a golfing death. But if anyone unfortunately becomes a fatality while they're diving, yes, it's included as a dive fatality, whether the diving actually had anything to do with it or not. But what's important to see is that, of course, the number one cause of death is drowning, which I don't think surprises anybody. Next in line, of course, is the arterial gas embolism, and after that, cardiac issues. What's most important to look at here is that 87%, 87% of all fatalities are made up of those three categories. We can make that better. We can lower those numbers. This is the results of a study that's been done retrospectively over a 12 year period. So this is good information to have. And most importantly, we can make a difference with those numbers. Dive safety, when we think about it, is a very broad term. There's a lot of things that add up and incorporate into dive safety. When you really look at the statistics and the repeat of things, there are key elements that we can all focus on. And we can definitely talk about the things that are most beneficial. What's going to give you the most bang for your buck, so to speak, if you will. It's important to remember with dive safety and a dive incident or accident, it's seldom an isolated event. There is a chain or sequence of events that take place that end up with an ultimate result. So we have to recognize that it isn't usually one thing, it's many things. In the statistics that we've gathered over the years, there are recurrent issues and problems. As rudimentary as they may seem, you have to remember these are things that keep repeating themselves every year, whether it's diver errors, equipment problems, and most importantly, ourselves. How are we fit? What's our physical fitness? What's our medical fitness? If we can recognize and prevent some of these things and know how to intervene, we can reduce the numbers of accidents and certainly of fatalities. I apologize for the powerful images that we have here. I know that can be a bit disturbing, but what's most important to take away from these is that the professionals that investigate these accidents, with very few exceptions, it is not the result of one single thing. It is a chain again or series of events that take place that ultimately cause these catastrophes. That's important to remember. It's consistent with all of these disasters, and it certainly is no different when it comes to diving accidents. Now, is anybody else besides me old enough to remember this game, Mousetrap? The idea was that you spent most of the game putting together this ridiculous machine, and ultimately the basket would fall and catch the little mice underneath there. If you remember this game well, you should remember that at any given point, if one of the elements of this game malfunctioned, it didn't continue and the mice weren't caught. We have to think about dive accidents the same way. If we can prevent or intervene at the right time, we can actually keep it from getting to a bad result. We can make a more positive influence on things. We need to define a couple of things. When we talk about a harmful event, what exactly does that mean? Harmful event is the actual condition or event that caused the injury or death. That's what we mean by a harmful event. What is it that directly or immediately contributed to whatever negative outcome there was? And when we talk about rapid ascent, what we mean for our purposes in this lecture, what we mean is a rapid ascent is anytime a diver makes a direct ascent to the surface 
with disregard to accepted safety practice. That's, in this incident, what we mean about a rapid ascent. And as you can see, based on the diving fatality study, the number one harmful event is a rapid ascent. I'm sure every one of you can think of multiple reasons why somebody might make a rapid ascent. Well, here's the main reason why. Believe it or not, the number one trigger for that rapid ascent is somebody being out of air or at least in their perception, low on air. Now that's about as rudimentary as it gets and it seems almost incredulous, especially any of us who drive a car. To us, if you've got a properly working fuel gauge, there's no reason you should ever run out of gas. Well, same idea. Why should we ever run out of our breathing gas? But it happens every year. Simplest solution, of course, is keep an eye on it. Monitor your pressure frequently and make sure that your dive plan includes a gas supply limit. We hear divers talking about depth limits or bottom time limits, but something that gets left out of that dive plan <clears throat> too often is the fact that when are you going to turn the dive around? When this diver or your buddy team, when you get to a certain PSI, be it 1,200 or 1,000, 1,500, when are you going to turn the dive around and start heading back? If you incorporate that ahead of time, That'll help you, one, keep better eye on your supply, and two, make it less likely that you're going to run into that out of air or low on air. And think about how much controversy there is with distracted driving, be it with cell phones or texting. Trying to dive while you're distracted, that can be problematic too. And it's very easy, um, as simple as being enamored with looking at the sea life or taking photographs. And yes, there are a lot of different distractions that can happen and it's easier than we might think but try to not let yourself get too distracted the best way to manage your breathing gas is to check your gauge often I know that's again rudimentary and I'm sorry to keep repeating it but that's what goes wrong people aren't monitoring their gas supply the better control you have on your buoyancy the better your gas consumption is going to be you don't have to make continued necessarily continued adjustments to your buoyancy, and the more hydrodynamic you are, the less air you're going to consume. Think about the factors that can increase your respiratory rate, how fast you're breathing. Certainly if you're working hard at depth, that can contribute, or simply being anxious. Has it been a long time since you've been in the water? Are you about to do something that you've never done before or not 100% comfortable? That can increase your respiratory rate. Also, what kind of physical condition are you in? If you haven't done any regular exercise since the last time you went diving, you may be less in shape and you might breathe more air that way. So please think about these things. How many of you actually know how much air you consume at your safety stop? That three to five minutes at 15 feet. If you know that already, that's wonderful. Those of you that don't know that, it's worth finding out. Now it will vary but you can get at least a ballpark figure, and yes, it will most likely be minimum. But even if it is only, let's say, 50 or 100 PSI, at least you know. And remember we talked about having a turnaround point for the dive? You can incorporate that little bit of air into that. If you've ever been diving in the Caribbean, most dive operators want you back on the boat with 500 PSI. So if you know that you use 100 PSI on your safety stop, you probably want to get to that safety stop with at least 600 PSI. So that way you've got enough for your safety stop and you still meet what they're requesting. Any little margin of safety, any extra cushion that we can add in there, the safer we can be. So these simple decisions can, can contribute greatly to our safety. And a fact that gets overlooked sometimes by divers is that depth is going to reduce the amount of time that your gas supply lasts. The deeper you go, the less time it's going to be. I don't care whether you're using a set of triples up here or a single 80. Whatever your supply is to start with, the deeper you go, less time it's going to last. So think about this in terms of sequence events. You know in this case, maybe you're a little anxious, you're breathing faster, going through your gas a little bit quicker. That can end up getting you into a situation. You see how that whole chain of events thing comes to play? Your buoyancy, 
that's the number two trigger for rapid ascent is inadequate buoyancy. And it all starts with proper weighting. We have to make sure that our weight is enough to allow us to sink, not make us sink. So good buoyancy check and getting practice with that. It's one of those skills that once you think you've got it mastered, you can forget about. You have to keep rehearsing it and doing it with every dive. And you have to adapt your weight to your exposure protection. You'll have to forgive me for using myself here, but as you can see, lycra skin, I only wear six pounds. And when I'm wearing my dry suit, when I'm doing my Great Lakes muck diving, it's 28 pounds, but it varies with your exposure protection. I've been diving in warm water and I see people wearing almost as much weight as you would expect them to wear when they're wearing a full quarter inch wetsuit and they're only wearing a shorty. So remember, your weight has to adapt to your exposure protection. And you want to constantly be mindful of your buoyancy, not only where you are in the water column, but also your trim. The more horizontal you are, the less surface area you're presenting to the water and the less work you have to do. And that's one of the advantages is that it does help improve your air consumption. Also, it helps keep you safe and keep the environment safe. Most marine injuries occur because we're not paying attention to where we are. So keep thinking about that buoyancy. That leads to that rapid ascent. So stay current with your buoyancy and think about it on every dive. Why it's important too is not only marine life injuries, but barotrauma to the ears and the sinuses. This is the most common injury that we talk to divers about. It shouldn't be, but it is. Number one way is to have controlled descents and ascents. We all know that, we're taught to do that. But if you don't have good buoyancy control, you can't do that. And it's very easy to start descending too quickly and have the eustachian tubes start to collapse. Then it becomes harder to equalize. So the better control you have on your buoyancy, the easier it is to prevent these injuries. Also, if you have recently had a middle ear squeeze or you've got allergies or cold symptoms, please think about that before you go diving. We've all been taught, you know, we shouldn't dive with any cold symptoms or allergy symptoms. Please remember that because we talk to too many divers who go ahead and dive anyways and they end up ruining a whole vacation. Um, it may not guarantee that you won't get an injury if you wait an extra day, but it sure could help. Even though you're over your cold and allergy symptoms, there is still some residual inflammation and swelling in the sinuses and in the middle ear, certainly the eustachian tubes. You may want to leave an extra day just to allow things to fully recover. Diving too soon, almost guaranteed you're going to have an injury that's going to keep you out of the water longer. And two, pain affects your thinking. You cannot think 100% clearly when you're in pain. No matter how good your pain tolerance is, you're not thinking clearly and logically. This also increases stress and anxiety when things are hurting. Please think about that, and that speeds up your gas consumption too. There are folks that chronically have difficulty equalizing, and I can tell you that those folks are stressed before they even get in the water because they're already thinking that they don't want to be the one holding up the whole dive group or they don't want to get left behind while everybody else is going down and they get separated. So that can pile up into stress and anxiety and that leads to all those other things. So please, if you know you've got chronic difficulty, you can work with an ENT. Most problems can be solved pretty easily. And certainly if you're interested in a referral, give us a call. But it's most important to work with these things. And if you're not 100%, probably shouldn't dive. Same thing with marine life injuries. Again, buoyancy is number one. These are not predatory species in the sense that they come after us, even the lionfish. Although with the sea urchins, I've never seen it or witnessed it firsthand, but I hear tell that these things will actually leap out at divers. Must be the case because of so many people that get injured by sea urchins. But remember, they're not lying in wait for us. We get clumsy and forget where we are in the column. So make sure you know and are aware of where you are in the water column. You can't do anything about surge, 
We all have had to at one time or another deal with surge. We can't, we can't do anything about that, but we can add a greater distance. If we know there's surge, we might want to stay farther away just to make sure we don't get pushed into the coral or the fire coral. And the lionfish consistently, the majority of people that we talk to that end up getting injured by a lionfish are people that have them at home in their aquarium. There have been very few folks that have actually been injured out in the wild by the lionfish. If they were, they were messing with them. And again, pain is not conducive to clear logical thinking. You get jabbed by a sea urchin or fire coral, you're not going to be thinking at your best. That too can build up the anxiety and the chances of a rapid ascent. Again, think of it in terms of that sequence of events, how we can break that chain. Skills do degrade. No matter how good a diver you are, the longer you're out of the water, the greater your skills are going to degrade. You have to think about refreshing your skills, be it formally or informally. And there's no universal time as far as how long you're out of the water should you take refresher course. Some agencies will say six months, some say a year. You have to be brutally honest in knowing where you are, what your skill level is, and if there's any doubt in your mind, please don't be overcautious. Go ahead and take a refresher. And certainly don't be overconfident and think you're prepared. Because we talk to too many divers who haven't been in the water in a while, and when they get back in the water, they're more frightened and more anxious than they think. Little things, if you take a look at the picture down in the lower right, it took me a while to figure this out. The regulator is on the cylinder correct, it's just that the cylinder is turned in the BCD 180 degrees from where it should be. Now, not a big deal, but it is, if you think about it, that changes your whole hose configuration. So no matter how good you are, it's little things that you can forget, things that we would normally do automatically. Those are the kind of things that can tend to get left out of the picture, so to speak. Everybody agrees that CPR is excellent skills. It can really make a difference in certain cases. We have to think about our air sharing skills the same way. We sincerely hope that we never have to use them, but when the need arises, we will be fully prepared to do it. Now an advantage when you're talking about CPR training, if you stay current with it, every two years or so, you're getting back into a class you get to talk about, refresh the skills, practice the skills. So you do have an opportunity to keep those somewhat sharp. When was the last time any of us practiced our air sharing skills? We've talked to divers where everything started off fine, where they were able to share air at depth, but as they started to make their ascent, things went horribly, terribly wrong. They couldn't remember how to hold on to their buddy, created a lot of anxiety, so it's worth being prepared and practice those skills. Hopefully, we'll never need them, but when you do need them, they can make a real difference. Don't just whisk your way through a buddy check. Being able to say, oh yeah, I can see your weight releases here, I can see that buckle there. You have to recall those kind of things in less than ideal circumstance. The same thing with the air sharing. You're not doing this <laughs> in the best of circumstance. Somebody's having a problem. Even in an emergent situation, that's when you have to be able to recall these things. Think about it. Just because you remember where their alternate air source is on the surface, and yeah, yeah, I know it's there. Remember, in an emergency situation, are you going to remember where it is? Are you going to remember that they have their integrated weight system? Are you going to remember that they have a separate weight belt? So all these things come into play. The same thing we know that certification doesn't always mean qualification. It's the beginning step. It says that we've achieved a minimum level in terms of skills and academics, and that's a point where we can really start to learn. So just because you've been certified at a certain level, you need to gain experience slowly, and don't get ahead of yourself. And remember, it's experience and practice that are going to make the most difference. I'd like you all to take a moment to look at that top statistic, and I'm going to pause for just a moment because I want you to really take in that statistic. 
40%, that's almost half of all fatalities involve buddy separation. Would everybody agree that that's something that we can fix? I think so, absolutely. That's too large a number, and that can be addressed. Now, exactly what role buddy separation played in the incident or fatality, we don't know for sure, but it certainly could be a contributing factor, and I don't think it takes much imagination to realize that. Exactly whether the staying with their buddy would have affected the outcome, that's not totally clear, but it's very reasonable to think at least in some cases, had they remained with their buddy, it would have made a very different and more positive outcome. Remember to talk over with your buddy what you're going to do if you do get separated. You know, obviously one of the most common ones is that you look for each other for no more than a minute, make a controlled ascent to the surface, and establish positive buoyancy. A part of that that gets left out is that once you're at the surface, you want to stay there. You can see at a local dive site, you can see where one diver comes up, goes back down, then the other one comes up. So the most important thing, excuse me, is to stay there. Once you're on the surface with positive buoyancy, stay there because your buddy is supposed to join you. But it doesn't do any good to know that unless you're sure that your buddy knows that. Please talk about it. Whatever your plan is, there's no right or wrong, but just make sure you're on the same plan. Buddy's a nice thing to have with entanglements. Now I realize I'm being a bit facetious with the animation down here, but that's a real common, as most of you know, the most common entanglement in diving is fishing line. So this is something that could happen. Certainly the tank valve could get caught and it'd be great to have a buddy because they can either unhook it or cut it for you. But it's important too to remember, let's say you don't have your buddy. We were all taught in basic open water class how to remove our scuba unit and put it back on. In this situation, that skill can come in very handy. You could take off your scuba unit, undo the entanglement, put it back on. How many of us would have the confidence to do that in a real life situation? So it all goes back to that skill practice, having good communication with your buddy and also practicing our own skills. In that communication, it's two ways. Remember, you have to be attentive to what they're telling you as well as they have to be attentive to you. Quite often when you're on a dive scene or certainly a dive boat, you may be talking to someone and they say, oh yeah, I've been diving for 20 years. And the more you talk to them, the more you realize they've been certified for 20 years, but in that 20 years, they may only have 30 or 40 dives. So that's a huge difference. So make sure you understand. Make sure that your dive styles are compatible. This may be somebody who's interested in going a long distance from the boat because there's something in particular they want to see. Make sure you're on the same page with that. It's that simple and it avoids a lot of other problems. Even if it's somebody you've been diving with for 10, 15 years, please every so often go over your hand signals because there's always some that come in handy that you maybe haven't used in three years. So be sure and review the hand signals. It's safer and more enjoyable for everybody. And you may find that there's a signal already exists that, that you don't have to try to point and figure out how you're going to tell your buddy about it. Here's a case example I want everybody to take a look at. Anybody see any problems with this to begin with? First of all, lobster hunting. Okay. Now in fairness, this young lady could be just as easily taking photographs or like me getting enamored with a cleaner station. Again, goes back to that distraction, correct? Absolutely. She became aware that it was getting harder and harder for her to breathe. She finally looked at her gauge. It indicated zero. Not a good sign. She, of course, ended up making that rapid ascent to the surface, and she had not practiced and did not remember that she needed to establish positive buoyancy. She did not drop her weights and was struggling at the surface. One of the things that was observed is that she was very furtively trying to press the inflator button on her BCD, 
problem is there was no air in the cylinder. So she could press that inflator button all day and it wasn't going to make any difference. Uh, she was close enough that other divers were able to assist her, but she did end up actually breathing in seawater. Now I think you'll all agree this could have had a worse horrible outcome. As it turned out, she developed pneumonia secondary to the aspiration, but she was discharged after two weeks perfectly healthy. This is a very fortunate young lady. But this certainly speaks to a lot of things. Distraction, not managing gas properly, not recalling training when you need it. She may have been a very experienced diver, had practiced these skills, but again, you have to recall those skills under a less than ideal circumstance. The number one equipment problem of all things that contributes to these dive accidents is the computer. And more often than not, it's because the divers are not familiar with their <laughs> individual computer. They don't know what the display means. Very simply, please thoroughly read the manual. It is that simple. You have to know what display on your computer is telling you. Also, understand the limitations of these things. They are all based on mathematical models known as algorithms. Um, I was on a day boat in South Carolina and there were two divers on board. They were talking at the surface interval. They had the same computer. One diver carried it in their console, the other wore it on their wrist. And they were talking about the features that they liked about the computer. The diver that wore it on their wrist said to the other diver, I can appreciate the convenience of having it in your console, but if I don't have it on my wrist, how's my computer going to know how much nitrogen I have? I was frightened and walked away. That kind of thinking is what gets divers into trouble. The computers do not know your individual body. They can't know how much nitrogen you as an individual have. It's based on those mathematical models. It's not a true representation of what you're doing and where you are physically. A lot of dive computers do have a planning mode. Take advantage of it. That way you can decide how long you're going to be at a given depth rather than just following the computer. You can exercise control. And those computer algorithms, they do not incorporate water temperature. You know, even if it displays the temperature, it doesn't build that into the algorithm. And even if it did, we're not sure of what significance that might have. They also have no idea if you're warm enough on that dive or too warm. They don't know that, and they can't incorporate that into the algorithm at all. Some computers can determine what your air consumption rate is because it's integrated. But remember, the computer's only measuring the air consumption. It doesn't know if you're just excited because you saw something that was rare or something that made you a little bit nervous, and it can't tell the difference between that and whether you're swimming against a one-knot current. It can only measure the consumption. So it has no idea if you're working hard at depth or just breathing quick. And exertion at depth and thermal stress are some of those things that can increase the risk for decompression sickness. So please keep those things in mind when you're thinking about your dive computer. Here's another case. Young man, single dive, 108 feet, 24 minutes was using the computer for no decompression. However, his computer showed that he needed to make a longer stop at 15 feet. He didn't understand what that display was telling him, so he only did four minutes at 15 feet. Now, his buddy's computer didn't show a need for that lengthier stop. This is one of the things we see too. Different computers will show different algorithms. Sometimes even the same make and model of a computer can have differences because one diver has it set more conservatively than the other. But the fact is that he did not understand what his computer was telling him. When he got back onto the boat, he asked the staff about what the display meant. They understood it better. And then they called us asking us what we should do, what they should do. Well, our first question, of course, is, is this diver having any symptoms? The answer, gratefully, was no. The next question was, should we put him back under the water to complete the remaining six minutes? 
Our answer was no, because he's lost the benefit now that he's on the surface. They wanted to know, should they start him on oxygen? Should they get him to the emergency room? And I, we all kind of put it back on them and said, well, what's your policy? A lot of times with starting oxygen, there's no right or wrong answer. But the fact remains that every dive operator should have a policy or procedure on what to do. Our thoughts were, as long as he doesn't have symptoms, probably nothing more to do. But if he does develop symptoms, then of course you want to approach it as you would any dive injury. Fortunately, this young man never developed symptoms, but he would have saved himself a lot of trouble if he'd have been more familiar with his own computer. The BCD is the number two equipment problem. Please make sure that you know yours very well. Of course, quite often divers rent them when they're on vacation, which is fine, but just make sure you do that thorough buddy check. Again, don't just pencil whip it as they say, make sure you go through it. One of the common things you'll see is divers will have this type of alternate second stage on their BCD. This integrates the alternate and the inflator deflator. I've seen too many divers that use this equipment. When they're going to descend, they dutifully hold a hose over their head and depress the button on the end. And what they're actually doing is purging the alternate second stage. They're not hitting the deflator button. You have to know where they are. Be familiar with this. This is an easy one to get wrong. Also, in an air sharing situation, if you're diving with someone that has this, be it you or your buddy, the, uh, how it works is that in the event that you have to share air, the person that has this as their alternate, they will breathe from that and give the other person their primary regulator. It's not a big deal, but you have to know that ahead of time. Because again, remember, this is a less than ideal situation. So you have to be sure you know how this works beforehand. Also, keep them well maintained. If it's your personal BCD, get it serviced annually, just like any other. Make sure it fits you. Because one, if it doesn't fit right, that can be a horrible distraction. And two, it can create all kinds of problems if it doesn't fit right. So as simple as that, as rudimentary as it sounds, it's still important. When we talk about fitness to dive, and we get a lot of questions on that, the thing you have to remember about fitness is not just your general medical health, but it does count in on a daily basis. How's your fitness on that day? What's your buddy's fitness? Especially for traveling divers. The more travel time you have, the greater number of time zones you cross, the more fatigued you're likely to be, the more <laughs> exhausted you're likely to be on the other end, as well as dehydrated. All these things come into play. Have you been seasick like our young lady here? Have you had traveler's diarrhea? Are you more tired than you should be? Even though you might recover from those things, you're still not going to be 100% necessarily the next day. So have to think about it. Are you at 100% or are you less than 100%? Fatigue is another one of those things that, that can really affect your performance. Same thing with being sleep deprived. If this is you and your buddies in the taxi on the way back to the resort in the wee hours of the morning, you might want to think about skipping the morning dive. You need to be fully rested and up to snuff. Especially, are you fit for the planned dive you have? This may not be the best day for you to make that 120 foot wreck dive you might be absolutely fine for a nice shallow, low stress reef dive, but you have to think about how you are that day. The same thing, are you mentally prepared for what you're about to do? If you're doing something new, a dive, even though it might be perfectly safe, if it's something you've never done before, if you're less than 100% on that day, is this the day you really want to do that? You might want to wait a day to where you've recovered better and are better rested because you're doing something new, it can raise that anxiety and that stress level. And the medications we use to treat seasickness or traveler's diarrhea, all these medications do have potential side effects. They're very safe and they are very good medicines, but they're not benign. They do have side effects that affect you. Most of the seasickness medications are antihistamines that can make you drowsy. Make sure you read these warning labels and please take them seriously. 
also our health history is very individual and you want to make sure that whatever over-the-counter medicines you're using are safe for you to use. Are they a problem with the medicines you're already taking? Are they safe for you on your health history to take? And make sure you try these well in advance to diving so you know how they make you feel. Some people can take Dramamine, it treats their seasickness, but they can still function just fine. Some people take Dramamine and are going to be asleep. So you have to know how these medications affect you. And some of the side effects can mimic decompression sickness. So now you can add to that confusion. Here's another case we want to take a look at. This is a gentleman who had been certified, and he really was a very experienced diver, had hundreds of dives. But he noticed in the past year that he, every time he dove, he was unable to urinate after he was done diving to the point that he had to go to the local emergency room and have a Foley catheter put in. But by the next day, he had recovered just fine. They were able to take the Foley out, and he was urinating normally. Now, some of you may recognize that the inability to urinate can be a sign of serious decompression sickness, uh, suggesting that maybe spinal cord. He had no other symptoms that suggested decompression sickness. It was just that inability to urinate had no weakness in the legs, no numbness, nothing else, which was kind of puzzling. And he had the symptoms regardless of what his dive profiles were. Didn't matter if he did two dives, three dives, didn't matter what depth they were. This happened almost every time. And it never occurred when he wasn't diving. It was consistently whenever he went diving. So one of our questions to this man was, do you have any history of any medical problems? At first, he was kind of reluctant because in his mind, it didn't seem to have anything to do with what we were talking about. But he finally said, yeah, I do have an enlarged prostate. This is a benign condition that happens to us men simply because we keep having birthdays. But it can make it harder and harder for us to urinate as we get older. Now, we also asked him, do you take Sudafed before you dive? He said, oh yeah, I take it all the time. If you read the product warning, on the Sudafed box, you'll see people that have problems with their prostate should not take it. This is what was happening. This is one of those side effects that he never anticipated. And in fairness, for 29 years, he never had to worry about it. But now that his health history has changed, now those side effects are something he had to be wary of. So please, as we age, as things change in our health history, we have to take those into account. Diving fitness isn't one single thing. It's a combination of our physical fitness and our medical fitness. Poor physical and medical fitness creates a greater risk of medical compromise. There's more things that can go wrong. We can have a reduced exercise capacity, which means we become fatigued and stressed out a lot sooner. It's certainly, if we're not in good condition or we have health problems, it reduces our stamina and what our reserve strength is. Doesn't matter what your energy level is at the beginning of the dive, how much gas do you have left in the tank at the end of the dive? So the more strength you have in reserve, the better off you're gonna be. For example, if your buddy comes up with a cramp, do you have enough energy and strength to be able to tow your buddy back to shore or back to the boat? That's important. Some of the medical complications, I'm not going to go too crazy with this because I think most of you know all of these, but certainly the poor shape you're in can lead to heart disease, diabetes, obesity, respiratory problems, vascular disease, stroke, and joint problems. And the list goes on. And you can certainly speak with your doctor about all these things to consider. Here's one of the things that concerns us, and this plays into the original statistics we looked at. 25 to 30 percent of all dive fatalities are cardiac related and that's right out of that same fatality report. This is why heart health and fitness are an absolute priority. You have to have a heart that's healthy enough. Are there people that have had heart problems that safely dive? Yes, but they've also been able to rehabilitate and have better lifestyle and all those other changes. This is the most common type of heart disease you'll see. It's the atherosclerosis. It's the narrowing there. This is the area that forms the clot 
where the MI or the heart attack can occur. This can be fixed with a stent or a bypass surgery. But how healthy your heart is, is absolutely important because you're still going to need to exercise, still going to need to exert yourself. The diving environment, when we talked about things being labeled a diving death, there are unique things. The diving environment decreases your survivability. For example, if you have chest pain on the golf course, EMS is usually only about six minutes away with advanced life support. Think about if you're an hour out from shore and 50 feet under the water. That can reduce your chances of survivability almost exponentially. It can make a huge difference based on the distance from care. So that's why it's important to be healthy. We get a lot of questions about the medications. The medications treat an underlying condition. 99% of the time, it's the underlying condition that's going to keep you out of the water more than the medication itself. There's a few medications themselves that are problematic. That's a topic for another lecture. But believe me, more often than not, it's the underlying condition. And you need to think about it in terms of the condition, not so much the medication. Any of us that are over 40, it's essential that we get that annual physical. And if you have any potential risk factors for cardiac issues, be family history, lifestyle, you may want to consider having a good cardiac evaluation from your doctor. But talk honestly with your doctor, and please, I can't emphasize enough, it's so crucial to our safety to be as healthy as we can be. Certainly as we get older, or even without us being older, our health system is dynamic. It doesn't remain the same. Things can change day to day, year to year. And it's not always dependent on age. There are some young people that have very serious health issues through no fault of their own. When you think about that medical fitness, is this a temporary problem or is this something that's chronic that you're going to deal with for a long time, such as a back problem? Or is it something that's going to clear up and be resolved in a few weeks or months? If it's temporary, don't push the envelope. Wait until it's completely resolved, you're completely healed, and that's going to be the safest. Uh, we've gotten calls literally from divers who wanted to know how they could keep the cast on their arm dry because they wanted to dive and they just broke their arm two days ago. Now that's kind of silly, but those are the kind of questions we get. Please, safest to let things heal or resolve first. If it's a long-term problem, then you can start adjusting to accommodate those things. We also get asked, at what age should we stop diving? The answer is nobody knows, and it's not based on chronological age. It's all how healthy you are. Let's face it, every year when you see marathons on TV, you've got people who are in their 70s and 80s that are competing quite nicely in marathons. Is that somebody that continue to safely dive? Probably. But there are people a lot younger whose health history would not be conducive to safe diving. So it isn't so much age, it's a matter about what your condition is. As our capability changes, you know, again, with like a back problem or a st strength decreases, stamina decreases, you can adjust to that. Eventually, it may get to the point where diving just isn't a good idea anymore. You have to, all of us, we have to be brutally honest with ourselves and really assess where we're at and is continuing to dive really best for us especially if it's going to increase any risks. And a saying you see a lot when it comes to this is it's not the years, it's the mileage. And that's very true because not all people are the same age or in the same fitness or health status. Here's a case example to take a look at. 48-year-old male diving from shore. That's a pretty benign dive, nothing of any particular risk. At depth, he didn't feel well and he needed assistance. He and his buddy made a safe ascent. Now, this case right here, to me, is a testament for how the buddy system is supposed to work. This gentleman had the help he needed when he needed it, and they were able to ascend safely. So, good testament to the buddy system. But once he got to the surface, he was extremely dizzy to the point that he actually had to lie down because he couldn't remain standing. 
Um, he denied any difficulty with equalization. No other obvious causes. A lot of times when divers are very dizzy, we first of all look to see if they had a problem with their ears because usually dizziness is tied in with that. Because of the severity and there was no other obvious reason for it, we began to ask more questions. We were told by the folks on the scene that he had a history of atrial fibrillation. That's when the upper chambers of the heart don't beat in an organized rhythm. They just kind of quiver. That by itself is usually not a huge problem. It's not life-threatening, but there can be complications from that. One of the things that can happen is they can have a very rapid heart rate, which causes them to get dizzy because the heart's not beating properly. They ended up calling local EMS, had him taken to local hospital, and they had to intervene medically in order to slow his heart down. When we talk about adjusting dive style, this man was in an open water environment and he and his buddy were able to make a controlled, safe ascent to the surface. What if they had been back in a cave system? The ability to make that direct ascent to the surface would have been lost. Or if they had been doing planned decompression diving, also that ability to make a straight, direct ascent to the surface is lost. Not that somebody that has heart problems shouldn't be diving, but remember, you want to take your health history into account and make sure that your style of diving and the type of diving is appropriate for you. As far as physical fitness goes, unless you've been living under a rock for the past 10 years, we all know that it's in our best interest to be in as good a health as we can be. Certainly, it reduces the risk of medical complications, increases strength, stamina, your, your private doctor can certainly be an excellent resource. There's plenty of wellness clinics, all kinds of resources to get information on exercise and how to improve your health and fitness. At alertdiver.com, there are articles on the website that specifically address fitness to dive and how to get fit. A good thing to do, too, is to evaluate what kind of condition you're in. This was a push-up table developed by Dr. Neil Pollock and others back in 1978. Now this is also available in the Dan Annual Report from 2008. Um, you certainly can access this online. I don't want to dwell on this, but this is a good way to get a measurement of what kind of physical strength you're in, what kind of shape you're in. Also, talking with one of our consulting cardiologists, they made a recommendation of being able to walk two miles in 28 minutes. Now, before you ask, no, walking one mile in 14 minutes or half a mile in seven minutes is not the same. It has to be two miles in 28 minutes. Now, that's a pretty good clip. The original audience that this was intended for were people that already had heart problems. But this is a reasonable evaluation tool for just about anybody. So it's something worth looking into. One of the things that gets left out of dive plans when we talk to divers about all the things they can do to reduce their risk of decompression sickness, the one thing that is either never mentioned or it's mentioned way down in that list is depth and time. That immediately translates to our decompression stress. That's something that we have control over. That's dive physics 101. Our exposure it measures our decompression stress. And we have control over that. That's seldom planned into any kind of dive plan. You can control what your exposure is. Think about using your computer in that planning mode because that allows you to choose how much decompression stress you're likely to have. Please calculate that into your choices, like how you plan your dives, sometimes where you're going to be diving. There are some areas that you travel to, there are no shallow dives. It's all deep dives. So you can use that kind of thinking and incorporate that into your assessment of the planning for the dive, what type of dives you want to do. We've all been taught don't push the limits for a no decompression limit. Don't push to the maximum. Doesn't matter whether you're using the tables or the computer. You have to think about it the same as a posted speed limit. Even though the interstate says we can legally go 65 miles an hour, I'm sure you will all agree with me that there are times that even though you're permitted to drive that fast, there are conditions in which that would not be wise. So you have to think of your bottom times the same way. 
Just because your computer says you can stay that long, should you? Here's what we mean when we talk about pushing the tables. This was a, a study that was done by the US Navy. Total number of dives read a large number. Depths varied, and you can see they weren't particularly deep dives. Okay? And they wanted to find out just how many divers got hurt. There was a total of 48 cases. Each column you see represents the number of divers that were hurt within each percentage. What they did, because the depths vary, what they did was they took the maximum no decompression limit that a diver could be at for that specific depth. So they took whatever that NDL was and they divided it into groups of 25%. So divers that used only 25%, no more than 25% of their maximum bottom time, there were only two divers that were hurt. Those that use up to 50%, again, you can see there were only about two divers that actually sustained an injury. So that was pretty low. Now, divers that used up to 75%, now we had about six divers. So that's increased fairly well from there to there. And then the divers that used more than 75% up to the maximum, now it's almost doubled from there to there and almost tripled. So you can see there's a significant increase. We're not trying to tell you that you should only use 75% or less of your bottom time, but please keep in mind that the more often you push it to the maximum, you are running the risk of injury. Those of you that are using nitrox, the first thing you have to decide is how are you using it and why are you using it? Are you looking to increase your safety or are you looking at it to extend your bottom time? Remember, nitrox is not automatically a safer gas. When you push nitrox all the way to the limit of the actual NDL for that, then you kind of lose the benefit. If you dive with nitrox, you can use it as though you're breathing air. As long as you leave your computer set for air or use your tables as though air, you're actually increasing the safety benefit. You still have to make sure that your nitrox mix is appropriate for the deepest plan depth because you still have to worry about oxygen toxicity. So with the appropriate gas mix, with that air bottom time, you can actually add another margin of safety. Remember when it comes to diving safety, it is a chain of events. Remember, it's not one single thing. And if we can intervene and prevent something at the right time, we can actually have a more positive influence on the outcome. Please check your pressure gauge often. As simple as that sounds, it will make a huge difference. Buoyancy, always practice, always think about it. And please don't be overconfident with your skills. It's worth practicing them and refreshing them, no matter what level you're at, be it formally or informally. But please, every so often review your skills, especially ones that we don't use often. And for heaven's sakes, please be a good buddy. We can reduce that 40% very easily, and it can make a real difference in it. Know your equipment well, keep it well-maintained, and certainly keep yourself well-maintained. Be as fit as you can possibly be. And think of your profiles in terms of what your decompression stress is and what you can do to increase that margin of safety by changing your thinking. I hope you understand now that you have direct power in terms of increasing your safety. And it's decisions that we all make that directly affect our safety. And even these simple categories will make a huge difference. And I want to challenge all of you now to do that very objective, brutally honest assessment of your skills, your fitness, and then make a true commitment to dive safety. Thank you very much.